Welcome to the introduction to compounding practice. In this lecture, we will be looking at, at chronic pain conditions. And the first chronic pain condition that we will be looking at will be osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is actually mm -hmm. a fascinating disease. Um, it truly is a public health concern, and it's actually the most common form of arthritis in the joints and there are many other forms for example rheumatoid arthritis so in the United States osteoarthritis is actually uh, the primary reason for a medical visit in people who are over the age of 60 so overall it's a very complex syndrome and there are multiple factors affecting the joints uh, that facilitate its degeneration but the most basic way to think about osteoarthritis pathophysiology is that it's age-related wear and tear. So basically it's a collection or accumulation of bone micro damage. Um, so as you're moving forward through life, as you're aging, as you're exercising, as you're doing all the daily activities of living that you normally do, you're causing structural damage to your bones. So collectively, the accumulation of all of that damage over the course of the lifetime can potentially lead to development of osteoarthritis. So it's not surprising that the prevalence of osteoarthritis will increase with age. So interestingly enough, it's more prevalent in men uh, when you're looking at people before uh, 50, and it actually tends to be more prevalent in women when you're looking at uh, people over 50. So. Basically, um, the three most common um, markers of the joint destruction are going to be the degeneration of the cartilage, also uh, the inflammatory syndrome or the inflammation that accompanies the destruction of the cartilage, and also uh, changes in the composition of synovial fluid. And all of that collectively um, can cause the destruction of the joint. So osteoarthritis can affect um, joints of the body. And what happens to the joints uh, when the joints become arthritic is that they tend to lose uh, freedom of rotation. So somebody can um, get a restricted mobility and uh, these individuals also tend to develop pain. So severe arthritis is actually uh, very painful and it can be almost like a disability because uh, somebody who has severe arthritis can have severely limited uh, mobility and um, that can impact their functional status and decrease their quality of life. Also, you know, chronic arthritis can lead to changes in mood and uh, development of depression and that makes if somebody severely disabled can move around, mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of um, pain in their joints, so it makes sense that they can uh, become depressed. So what are the signs and symptoms of osteoarthritis? So like we mentioned before, stiffness, pain in the joints, swelling. Uh, sometimes people experience this grinding sensation within the joints. Also limited mobility and basically inability to use the joints properly. So uh, CDC published uh, these statistics on their website and you're welcome to refer to it to learn a little bit more about osteoarthritis, but uh, 27 million people in the United States actually suffer from osteoarthritis. How do you put that into perspective? Well, Afghanistan, <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with this country, uh, as a country has a population of 27 million people. So just to give you a different perspective on how prevalent osteoarthritis is in the United States. Also, some of the other statistics they published on the website, um, nearly one in two people um, may actually develop symptomatic knee osteoarthritis by the time they reach age 85, so that's every second person. Um, and then two out of the three people who are obese may actually develop symptomatic knee osteoarthritis in their lifetime. And oh, this makes sense because obesity is a huge risk factor um, for development of arthritis and um, disease progression as well. So before we move any further, let's uh, establish a glossary and uh, define some of the terms that we'll be using in this lecture. 
So what is a joint? A joint is actually an articulation. So basically think of it as a location or physical space where bones are going to meet and connect. And this is what's going to allow for that beautiful fluidity of movement that you see and experience um, every time that you're walking or you're running. And this is also what's going to provide structural and mechanical support for you when you move. So what is AC or articular cartilage? This is basically going to be a white tissue and what it does, it covers uh, the surface of the joint and interestingly enough, it actually lacks blood vessels and nerves. Uh, its main purpose, it basically provides a nice homeostatic environment for the joint. Uh, subchondral bone is going to be a thin layer. Um, it's a layer of bone that's just basically below the cartilage. A tendon is um, a strong support band. It's basically like a cord of collagen tissue. And what it does, it's going to attach a muscle to the bone. And that's what's going to also allow you to move. And then synovium is a thin layer of cells or a tissue that's going to line the joints. So which joints actually are uh, traditionally affected in osteoarthritis? So first of all, uh, an important point to realize is that somebody who has osteoarthritis may have multiple joints that can actually be affected at once. So some of the common joints that are traditionally affected are um, your knees, digits, uh, hips are very commonly affected. That's why people have hip replacement surgeries. And also lumbar spine and a cervical spine. So now, looking at this picture, what do you see? So this is an x-ray radiograph. So let's pretend you're a radiologist who's working in a hospital. And here you're looking at this x-ray of a patient who has osteoarthritis. So what are you going to see? Let me show you and let me uh, orient you a little bit so that you know what you're looking at. So this bone right here, this is called a femur and it's this bone right here. This beautiful delicate bone in the back, this thin looking bone, this is called a fibula and it's right here. And this thicker bone in the front mm -hmm. right here, this is called a tibia, and that's what you're looking at. So you're looking at femur, you're looking at fibula, and you're looking at tibia. So you, when you see um, them articulating together, you see that this joint space is actually narrowing. And oftentimes, um, there can be what's known as osteophyte lesions. And they're like this little um, sharp things that can be very painful and all of this together is going to basically lead to swelling in a joint, which is going to cause severe pain and stiffness to the patient. So this is what an osteoarthritic knee looks like. So looking into the future, uh, some actually estimate that by 2020, the number of people that are going to be suffering from osteoarthritis is likely to double. And that makes sense because we have a baby boomer generation that's going to retire. So uh, we're going to have a lot more people uh, that are older that can develop osteoarthritis. We also have increasing population obesity. And like I mentioned, um, uh, obesity is a huge risk factor for osteoarthritis. And all of those factors, um, you know, is going to have a tangible impact on healthcare resources and perhaps we'll need to make some changes in healthcare um, to be able to provide medical care to all of these people. So what are some of the risk factors for osteoarthritis? So like I mentioned, it's um, a disease that you really need to think of it as a structural wear and tear, accumulation of bone, micro damage. So it makes sense that age, as you age, as you become older, um, you're much more likely to develop osteoarthritis. In fact, some statistics estimate that 60% of people of the age of 75 are affected uh, because basically what you're doing is you're compiling structural damage over a long period. Uh, females are at much higher risk than males 
but um, there's a different joints that are affected and females that tend to be affected versus males. So there's a disparity in which joints are, are affected. Um, genetic factors play a role. So um, some people can be carriers of these so-called defective alleles. And these defective alleles, maybe they'll, um, you know, maybe these genes encode for proteins that are involved in extracellular matrix remodeling or certain pathways of inflammatory response. So people that uh, tend to have these defective alleles of the genes uh, might be at higher risk of development of osteoarthritis. And lastly, biochemical factors, you know, reduce muscle strength, repetitive stress and damage to your joints. So we mentioned before um, that obesity is a strong risk factor uh, for disease progression. So how do you actually define somebody who is medically obese? So we do that by using um, this variable known as BMI or body mass index and it's basically an alternative way to measure body fat. So here you have a formula uh, that's using pounds and inches and you can calculate your own BMI but if we calculate a BMI for somebody like me or an average person, say somebody who weighs 140 pounds and their height is 5'7", you see that their BMI would be about 22, so that would be considered normal. So somebody who is obese is somebody who have a BMI um, that's greater than 30. So one thing, uh, like a little disclaimer that I have to mention is that this formula and this calculation only really applies to somebody like an average person, somebody who doesn't exercise a lot, or if they do, they do mild to moderate forms of exercise that don't really build muscle. Because if you look at a professional athlete or like a bodybuilder, somebody who lifts weights, uh, they're building muscle, and muscle tends to weigh a lot um, heavier than fat. So these people, even though they may weigh more and be medically considered obese, their actual percentage of body fat um, is a lot smaller than uh, an average person. So uh, what that basically means is that, you know, BMI is not really applicable to them as an accurate way to measure body fat. And actually, uh, meta-analysis demonstrate that even a moderate weight loss will decrease disability in individuals with osteoarthritis or severity of symptoms. Another risk factor for development of osteoarthritis is joint injuries. Basically, uh, you know, if you suffer a meniscal tear when you're playing soccer, when you're in your 20s, or some sort of structural damage to your ligaments or injuries to the cartilage, all of that puts you at risk of development of osteoarthritis later on. So let's imagine you're a general medicine uh, primary care physician and you're general medicine clinic and you're seeing patients. So who's going to be a typical osteoarthritis patient? So somebody who is older, somebody who's greater than 45 years old, somebody who comes to you and says, doctor, I have chronic pain in my knees. So that tells you that they have ongoing joint pain. And they say to your doctor, you know, I have chronic pain in my knees and this pain is aggravated when I'm walking every day on my daily walk through Central Park. So the pain is actually aggravated by constant use of joints. Also, maybe they experience morning stiffness and it's typically lasting less than 30 minutes, but it's still noticeable. And of course, symptoms can vary from person to person. So this concludes um, the end of lecture one for osteoarthritis. Thank you so much for your time and we will move forward and we will continue with lecture two and osteoarthritis.